And if you're just getting into the waiting room, we're just waiting for a critical mass of people to join us in the virtual space. We'll get started in just a moment um, once we're all gathered. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started as people continue to join us. Hi everyone, I'm Julia, a bookseller with Politics and Prose. We're live with Amanda L. Tyler, Claire Spera, and Matt Ford discussing Justice, Justice Thou Shalt Pursue, Volume 2, and the life and legacy of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You can follow the link in the chat to get the book directly from us at Politics and Prose. If you have a question for our speakers, use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to your questions in the last portion of the discussion, though we apologize in advance if we run short on time. And before we jump in, we do want to thank all of you out there for joining us. We're really grateful to our family of loyal customers who keep our business and our spirits afloat. It's my pleasure to introduce this event. Justice, Justice Thou Shalt Pursue, Volume 2 compiles previously unpublished speeches, briefs, oral arguments, and dissenting opinions of the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and traces the long history of her work for gender equality and a more perfect union. The collection is a result of a period of collaboration between Ginsburg and Amanda L. Tyler, a Berkeley law professor and former Ginsburg law clerk. Here, the two bring together that collaboration and previously unpublished material sharing details from Justice Ginsburg's family life and long career. Each document was chosen by Ginsburg and Tyler to tell the story of the litigation strategy and optimistic vision that were at the heart of Ginsburg's unwavering commitment to the achievement of justice. Tyler will be joined in conversation by Claire Spera. She is an Equal Justice Works Fellowship attorney at the American Civil Liberties Union's Reproductive Freedom Project. Prior to her fellowship, she served as a law clerk at the Honorable Justice A. Katzman of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit and the Honorable Denise L. Cote of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York. She's a graduate of Harvard Law School, where her 2017 law school class was evenly split among men and women for the first time in the institution's history, a far cry from 1956 when her grandmother, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, was one among nine women entering her Harvard Law School class. And moderating this evening is Matt Ford, a staff writer at the New Republic. His work focuses on law, the courts, and democracy. Originally from Nevada, Matt previously wrote for The Atlantic. On behalf of Politics and Prose, please join me in welcoming Amanda L. Tyler, Clara Sfera, and Matt Ford. Thank you all so much. And thank you uh, for hosting us. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to take a, a very minimalist role uh, here tonight because I'm uh, as eager as I, I think the rest of you are to hear from uh, the other two panelists. Uh, so I'll, I'll dive right in. Uh, Amanda, this is, I believe, the last published work uh, in which Justice Ginsburg played a significant role. Uh, can you tell us a bit about how this, this project began and, and what that sort of responsibility feels like? I'm, I'm very happy to tell the story of the origins of the book because it's one of a pair of books in which Justice Ginsburg played a significant role. So she came to talk with me about her life and her career in the fall of 2019. She came to UC Berkeley and I interviewed her and we decided that we would turn our conversation into a book project for a number of reasons, one of which was we knew that at the time of her visit, the University of California Press was considering publishing another book. And that book is called Paving the Way, The First American Women Law Professors. Importantly, that book was written by Herma Hill Kay, who was Justice Ginsburg's longtime, very close friend. The two of them together with a third co-author, Kenneth Davidson, had written the very first casebook on sex discrimination in the law, effectively founding the field in the early 1970s. Now, Herma passed away in 2017 with her manuscript still unpublished. In 2015, Justice Ginsburg had written the introduction for Paving the Way. And so, as you can imagine, when she came to Berkeley in 2019, 
and we knew it still wasn't published and didn't have a home, and we heard that UC Press was looking at it, we thought, well, why don't we propose that we take our conversation, which was held at an event honoring Herman Hoke, and suggest that we turn it into a book project and the two books could release together as part of a new Law in the Public Square series. And so it's very happily that I sit here today with the two books over my shoulder side by side, and then I can report that they're both releasing this spring together. I will say, however, that I would be a lot happier, as I know everyone else would, especially her family, if Justice Ginsburg was here with us. And I say that for all the very obvious reasons, but also because the publication of Herma's book in particular was so important to her. And I know she would just be so thrilled to be able to see it finally at long last in print. You know, you mentioned that this is, is for a Law and Public Square series. And I, I think that really speaks to how Justice Ginsburg had such a, an impact, uh, not just in the legal community, but in the broader uh, country and the public consciousness as well. Clara, if I, if I could turn to you, why, why do you think Justice Ginsburg's life and career, your grandmother, uh, resonated so much with the broader public? Uh, you know, it's a question I'm still grappling with because to me, she was my grandmother uh, and I don't really have that many octogenarians that I fan over. Um, but I think she really struck a chord with you know, a wider audience beyond just the law and especially with younger women sort of of my generation. Um, obviously the notorious RBG sort of meme and all that it became was started by a young attorney, a, a law student at the time of, of my, a, a contemporary of mine. Um, and uh, I think that she was really inspired by the force of uh, my grandmother's dissents in particular. I think it all started with the Shelby County dissent, which is included in the book. Um, and she, I think, was a voice that was speaking truth to power during a time when young people were trying to find their footing uh, in the country and in the world. Um, and I think there's something a little sort of non-threatening about looking up to a person who's so much older because you're not you know, worried about competition, right? She's just so far beyond where you are in that moment that she just serves as a, uh, uh, as an inspiration. Uh, and so I think it was a mix of factors of timing, sort of who she was, um, where, you know, and, uh, when Shelby County came about. Um, and, and I also think just to add, I, I think often when thinking about intergeneral con intergenerational conversations, it's easy for younger generations to look at older generations and say, I would have done things differently or um, have you know, disappointment in those who came before us. And it's easier to do that sometimes than to appreciate uh, the work of the older generations and to understand maybe the barriers that they faced. But I think that there was something about my grandmother where, you know, women in particular, but all people looked to her and said, you know, what she achieved as a young woman, as a young adult in law school, early career, and then ultimately at the Supreme Court, sort of inspirational at every stage. Um, and I'd like to think that she didn't let us down when it came down to it. So I, I, sorry, it's, it's sort of a mumbling, rambling non-answer, but I think there are a lot of factors and there, there are maybe the people who are better suited to answer than I am. You, you highlighted Shelby County, uh, for instance, and that, that really stands out as a case where sort of her public profile really began to, to take off where she became much more celebrated. Um, you know, Amanda, if, if I could pivot back to you, one of the things that's striking about that decision now um, it's one of the four that you, you mentioned in the book that you, you highlight uh, is how prophetic it is, you know, with what we mm -hmm. see on, on headlines these days. Uh, can you guide us a bit through how you chose these four cases and, and sort of in particular Shelby County, um, what you think the, the impact of that has been? Absolutely. She, uh, you know, it's funny when we were working on the book, as I said, we started with the conversation where I interviewed her about her life and career. 
And then we had this really fun period where we said, okay, well, what can we put in here that will complement and sort of trace that story? So just to, to step back for a minute, we have materials from when she was an advocate, including the very first gender discrimination brief that she filed uh, in a lawsuit, which she filed in partnership with Claire's grandfather, her husband, Marty. Um, and that's the case that's at the center of the movie on the basis of sex uh, that was interestingly enough written by her nephew. And she talks about that in the book. She was very proud of that. Um, and then we move on to when she's a justice and we have a number of materials, including her four favorite opinions, one of which is the Shelby County dissent, as you would expect it would be. Um, what's why I'm smiling is because as the process unfolded, I would go back to her and suggest, well, gosh, you know, Justice, I called her Justice. I really like this opinion. How about we include this one? She said, no, no, those four. Those are the four. <laughs> so uh, she always, at least in my encounters with her, she always had a very fixed idea of what she wanted and what she thought. And uh, she certainly entertained my suggestions and occasionally went with them. But with that, she had a very clear idea. These were the four opinions that if someone read nothing else from her time on the court, these are the ones she wanted them to read. And I think Shelby County was really important to her, not because it, and I could be wrong, but I, I doubt Claire will disagree. Maybe she will. Not because it catapulted her into this iconic status as the notorious RBG, but because she was very proud of what she had written and she really believed that she was right. And I think to your reference, history is bearing that out. So, you know, for those who are not familiar with Shelby County, that is a case in which the majority, five justice majority for the Supreme Court effectively gutted two of the most important provisions in the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which itself is probably uh, one of, if not the most important piece of civil rights legislation ever enacted. And writing for four justices, her dissent is nothing short of a tour de force. She calls out the majority's hubris. She uses the wonderful line in which she says that throwing away the system of preclearance under the Voting Rights Act because it's working is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. And I, I love that she wanted to include it because you read it and you really get the full flavor of her brilliance, her resilience, how she never backed down from a fight, but she's also laying a roadmap out for the work that remains to be done. And as we see in the headlines just this week, that work is ongoing. Uh, the work of ensuring open and non-discriminatory access to voting is so crucial and so important um, and still something for which we have to keep fighting. You mentioned the uh, three other cases um, that you also took part in as an advocate. Uh, Moritz um, is the one that you mentioned that's the, uh, the brief she co-offered with, with Martin Ginsburg. Um, there were also two other cases involved there. And what's striking to me is that of those three cases, two of them um, involve uh, plaintiffs who were men, who were disadvantaged because of their uh, sex. And, and we normally don't think of that when we think of, of sex discrimination cases. Was that intentional? Is there a, a, a strategy at work there? Well, you know, I was born in the 1970s, so I'm about to say you have to put yourself in the 1970s, but I don't remember it in any meaningful way. But what I know about that decade is that until President Carter starts putting women on the federal bench, the judges before whom she's bringing these cases are all men. And so she's got to figure out a way to make the male audience understand how gender discrimination and, and specifically classifications based on gender don't just hurt women, they also hurt men. And together they hold both genders back, all genders back from achieving their full human potential and being able to chart their own course in life. And so it's not accidental that some of her most prominent cases involved male plaintiffs because it made it very easy for her to convey to the judges and specifically the all male Supreme Court 
how discrimination cuts in a lot of different directions. And ultimately the idea was to show that despite what people thought, women are not in fact the darlings of the law, but these kinds of laws hold women back. And they also, to your point, they also hold back men. And it was a strategy that was wildly successful. So I, I, I think uh, it's, it's only fitting that we highlight it in part in the book. You know, Claire, you, you followed in uh, your grandmother's footsteps as a lawyer and, and now as, as a uh, attorney at the American Civil Liberties Union. What, what sort of advice did she give you along the way um, as you chose that path? You know, she, I would say she gave me advice in, in sort of bits and bobs along the way, but one of the key pieces of advice she gave me when I started law school, and I know that this is a piece of advice she gave my mom as well, and maybe others, uh, and it sounds, you know, really silly, but she said that after every class, when I was taking notes in class, that before I closed my book to go to the next thing, whether it was another class or lunch or end the day, I should quickly reread the notes that I had written and that then they would stick in my head far better than if I just left them and were to revisit them a month or two later when I was studying for an exam. Uh, and, you know, I took her advice for the most part in the classes where I did that diligently. I performed much better than in the classes where I didn't. Um, but, you know, I think that really spoke to her pragmatism. Uh, you know, she often, uh, you know, gave advice that was similarly pragmatic or useful as opposed to sort of pie in the sky, you know, big uh, imagination type, um, type advice. And I'm sure the same was true of Amanda's experience when she was clerking uh, with my grandmother and that, you know, she's to the point practical and gives advice that will actually help your life or help your career. And that is a piece of advice that I've taken with me beyond law school. If I'm in a meeting or if I'm in a hearing, you know, after, after everything's over, I just take those extra couple of minutes and then I just retain whatever it is that just happened far better than when I don't. One of the things that's striking about the, when you read through the, the writings himself, uh, especially, you know, as an advocate, you see the real sense of clarity that comes through them, um, which is especially when she's making an argument, not just you know deciding a case as, as a justice. Um, there's a real focus there, and there's also a sense of, of sort of perseverance uh, throughout that. And I think that's that's one of the traits with which she was most admired over, especially over the last ten years. Um, I'm curious if you can shed some light on on where that sense of persistence came from. Mm -hmm. Sure, and you know when I think about it, I think that the persistence came from necessity and honestly, a real history of adversity that she had to overcome from a young age. And that adversity was generational. You know, her own mother had to fight to be able to graduate from high school. She did sort of double sessions, day classes and night classes in order to get her degree at the age of around 15. And it's because her family just wanted her to work and help make money and help support her older brother, who was the one who was going to get to go to college and do, you know, big things. And so when it came time for her daughter, she obviously instilled a real love of learning. But my grandmother was born during the Depression when everyone was struggling. Uh, you know, she her older sister passed away when she was just a toddler. Uh, her own mother died the day before her high school graduation. I mean, it's just sort of a catalog of adversity before she's even an adult. And that obviously continued um, in terms of some of the challenges she met as she entered her profession, uh, whether that was, um, you know, my grandfather's unexpected illness during his second year of law school, her first, uh, or that she couldn't get a job after she graduated, despite being the very tied for first in her class at Columbia Law School and being on both the Columbia Law Review and the Harvard Law Review. Uh, and of course, you know, she battled cancer herself throughout her later years. And so, you know, this is not to dampen the mood, but I think all this to say is that the persistence, you know, came because it had to, and she never considered sort of giving up or calling it a day. Uh, and that, you know, she, 
she was dealt a pretty difficult hand. And sometimes it's, uh, it's easy to forget that when you see all that she's accomplished and that she had this pretty incredible life, especially, you know, after being um, nominated and confirmed to serve on the Supreme Court, but she worked very, very hard to get there. Um, yesterday, actually, the mayor of New York uh, named a the municipal building in Brooklyn after her. It is now the Ruth Bader Ginsburg Municipal Building. And in his remarks, he noted that she was certainly not born with a silver spoon in her mouth. And I couldn't agree with that more. She also had um, people around her who certainly helped. And I think, of course, of, of in the speeches, how Martin, especially his grandfather, um, she always made sure to highlight how theirs was a very equal marriage. Um, you know, you, you talk about adversity. We've had, come through a year now where we've seen millions of women pushed out of, of uh, the workforce. We've seen millions of women forced to assume sort of greater domestic roles. Um, I'd, I'd love to get both of your thoughts on this. Is, is this a step back? Is this a, a sign of progress that's yet to be made? I'll, I'll lead off. <laughs> um, I think it's been a frustrating year and it's been a frustrating year to watch so many things happen, including what you've highlighted, Matt. Um, the, the effect on women in the workforce has, has been dramatic. And, you know, I think back to something that Justice Ginsburg long said and, and said when I interviewed her, this discussion is in the book, that women will achieve equality when their partners step up and, and help with equal parenting. And what we've seen is that that struggle is still ongoing. It's a big part of how she was able to accomplish what she did because she had a real partner in life. And, uh, and she had, as you've heard, unbelievable determination and perseverance. Um, you know, I, I, I think she, she just so very much wanted to contribute. She wanted to serve and she wanted to do her part. And, she had this incredible drive and strength that just grew with every roadblock that she overcame, every adversity that she faced. But the beauty of it was that she had this incredible life partner next to her who was cheering her on. I mean, uh, Marty was a prominent force in getting her considered and ultimately nominated to the Supreme Court. Uh, Ron Klain has spoken publicly about this. So that's a pretty special relationship. Um, but as you say, we're still, we're still fighting that battle in the workforce. We're still trying to see how parenting, see that parenting is shared and that it's not one gender versus another that bears the brunt. And then when things go south, really um, has to sacrifice for that. Uh, and unfortunately, the last year has shown that we still have quite a lot of work left to do on this score. I don't know, Clara, if you wanted to add anything, maybe tell us more about your grandparents. Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything that you just said, Amanda, especially when it comes to the notion that, you know, it, the fact that so many women exited the workforce, you know, may demonstrate that there's still a ways to go, right? Um, it, so in a family situation, right, the socioeconomic impact will be less felt from the partner who stays home if that if the person makes less money sorry i, I garbled that but i think it, i i think i i made my, i'm trying to make myself clear right if there are two people and one person makes less money the person who makes less money will forego the job and stay home in situations where that becomes necessary and we've learned that more likely than not in a heterosexual couple that will be the woman um and that you know is obviously troubling and problematic i do think there may be another side to that coin however which is it's possible and you know i've seen this in the work that i do at the aclu that perhaps it's that women are more likely to take socially conscious jobs jobs at nonprofits at ngos and the government that tend to be less well remunerated than private sector jobs uh and as a result when it comes to these types of decisions, the women are more likely to step back. But I think it, there may be something to be said for the fact that women are more likely to take jobs that do potentially more social good in the world, but get paid less. And perhaps that the issue is that they get that we don't value that work as highly as we value other types of especially private sector work. And so again, 
to what Amanda was saying, there's still work to do and we still have far to go. But it's, in my view, it could be less that women aren't working, but it's the type of work that they're taking. And I, you know, I'm quite proud of the fact that at the ACLU Reproductive Freedom Project, where I work, we are a super majority of women lawyers in my, in my project. And I can't speak for the ACLU legal department as a whole, but it is certainly um, an organization where uh, not just women, but LGBT and racial minorities are really very well represented in, within the legal staff, at least. You, you mentioned, I, I think back to four years ago when I uh, was covering the, the first travel man, and that involved you know, driving to Dulles Airport here in DC, you know, seeing uh, uh, the lawyers, volunteer lawyers who gathered and, and were trying to help people who were affected by it. Uh, one of the things that struck me most was that I would estimate that probably 70% of the, the lawyers who were there were young women. Um, how do you think Justice Ginsburg's legacy has, has sort of shaped that next generation of women lawyers in this country? Clara, you want to pick this one? <laughs> sure. And, you know, and obviously I would love for you to chime in, but, you know, I think that um, if you look at, for example, uh, the individuals that comprise at least the federal bench, and there are lots of people who have spoken to this, I'm thinking in particular organizations like People's Parity Project, those who make up the federal bench tend to be former private sector lawyers or pri uh, former prosecutors. Many are not in the mold of my grandmother who was an ACLU attorney and a um, you know, obviously, you know, a gender rights advocate and then an academic. Uh, but she showed people that that is a viable path to the federal bench. And I think that sort of the explosion of her public profile over the past decade may have reminded people of that and inspired younger attorneys or those starting in their legal careers that if that's something that they hope to achieve one day to become a judge or, or work in sort of the upper echelons of government that while the path of least resistance may be private sector partnership at a law firm or prosecutorial work, which, you know, and I'm not poo-pooing that work, but it's to say it's not the only option. And it may be that that, that her presence there, and she of course is not alone in, uh, federal judges who have that public sector experience, but I think they are the minority, um, but that she was so public and became, you know, such um, a, an adored public figure over the past 10 years may have inspired lawyers of my generation to follow a path of passion as opposed to a path of financial remuneration. I, I would just add that you know, there's a passage in the book where I ask her, how do you feel about uh, Clara's description of her class having finally uh, a majority of women? And I had her in front of an audience at UC Berkeley where in our law school, our student body is 60% women. I said, how do you feel about that? And she, she just said, ecstatic. Women are finally welcome at the bar and in the profession. And your story underscores that women lawyers are doing incredible work as Clara's highlighted and as Clara's own work uh, underscores uh, that we have women lawyers in all walks of the profession and it's, it's just extraordinary how far we've come. And I think the justice was really happy about what she had seen in her life. That's not to say there isn't still a lot of work to do, but one of the things that especially as I've been going back through old speeches of hers, really resonates is that she drew from having seen as much progress as she saw in her life, a great optimism for what can be achieved. And I, I hope that people take that away from her legacy and also from the book, that there, there is this optimism that runs through all that she did and suggests that even though there are mountains yet to climb, we, we can get there if we just, as she did, sort of put your nose down and do the work. You mentioned earlier uh, uh, Professor uh, Herma Hill Kay, um, who was sort of the genesis for this book and the memorial lecture that uh, Justice Ginsburg gave a few years ago. Um, for those who aren't really familiar with, with her and, and her work, uh, Professor Kay, um, what, what made that so significant? Well, I think a big part of it was that Kay was with Justice Ginsburg, part of this groundswell movement to really start attacking institutionalized gender discrimination 
to create a field of law around the idea that we could wield the, the Equal Protection Clause as a tool for combating discrimination based on gender. They wrote a case book together, the first case book on the topic. Then uh, each was uh, very prominent as, as a scholar. Both wrote a lot about gender discrimination, both litigated gender discrimination cases. Justice Ginsburg litigated far more, but Herma, she was Herma to me, uh, Professor Kay, Dean Kay, uh, she also argued a gender discrimination case in front of the Supreme Court and had a long and storied career at Berkeley Law as our first woman dean. Uh, as a mentor, like Justice Ginsburg, to so many, including myself, I had the great joy and privilege of being mentored by both of them. Um, and she just really was a leader in our profession and someone who worked, and, and there's discussion of her in the book. There's a speech, a tribute that Justice Ginsburg gave to her in the book. She's someone who worked really tirelessly as dean to open up opportunities for first-generation professionals, uh, for minorities to come and enter the profession, women to enter the profession and thrive. And so the legacy that Herma Hill Kay leaves is very similar in many respects to the legacy that Justice Ginsburg left. Um, Claire, one of the threads that really stands out throughout this book is, is that, that your grandmother faced is, is sort of the tension between sort of taking radical steps to achieve gender equality and taking incremental steps to get there. Um, how, how do you think your grandmother navigated those shoals, um, so to speak? You, you know, I, I think it's somewhat of a false dichotomy because I think that incremental change can be radical. And I think that she would have agreed with that. And if we think about, for example, um, the, the cases that Thurgood Marshall led before the Supreme Court in the 1960s on racial equality. You know, Brown v. Board was a radical case, but it was built on incremental change, smaller cases that Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP brought to um, step by step building toward Brown v. Board. And I think the same thing can be said of my grandmother's strategy as an advocate in the 70s, which ultimately culminated in the VMI decision, which she authored, and the opinion is, of course, in this book. Uh, and so you see the through line of the, her advocacy through to the VMI case um, through through the book. Uh, and so I, I, you know, I hesitate to, to say that one trumps the other or, or, or she would have um, advocated for one above the other because I think that incremental change can indeed be radical uh, and you always take the long view um, or she always took the long view and the end point was a, from a, a place of, of, rad of radical change but she understood that especially in the courts, in the federal courts, that you couldn't get from A to Z in one fell swoop but you had to indeed go step by step. Uh, Amanda, can you tell me a little bit more about her oral argument in, in Frontiero? Uh, you know, touching on this theme, there's there's an excellent part where, if, if you haven't read it, she goes through um, laying out very clearly this case, and then at the end, she has this very blunt point, this, this quote from Sarah Grimke, um, where she said, I ask no favor for my sex. All I ask of our brethren is that they take their feet off our necks. And that's, that's pretty, pretty stern stuff for a Supreme Court oral argument. What, what was the strategy there? So I, I asked her about this and our discussion is in the book. I said, you know, if you go back and you read that or you listen to it, it's truly remarkable on so many different planes. Among other things, she speaks for over 10 minutes without being interrupted. And that would never ever happen at the Supreme Court today. Anyone who knows anything about the court knows that uh, it got so bad such that advocates couldn't even get out a sentence before being interrupted. So recently the court had to institute a rule that advocates get two minutes, I think it's either two or three minutes mm -hmm. uh, to talk in, uninterrupted before they can be questioned. So for her to get up there and speak in what was her first argument before the court uninterrupted for over 10 minutes was remarkable. And I, I asked her, I said, you know, what was going on? And she said, well, I was at sea and I couldn't tell whether they were listening to me. I was trying to make them see discrimination in a new way to understand how it impacts both men and women. In that case, you have a female plaintiff. The, the question is whether her spouse, her male spouse should get the same benefits, military benefits 
that she would have gotten if the roles had been reversed. Um, and so it's another case where you see discrimination running in multiple directions. And she said, you know, I just had to make sure I had their attention. So I decided to go for it and quote Sarah Grimke. And it's such an awesome, awesome line and an awesome quote. And, um, you know, it, it just shows if you go back and you listen to it or you read it in the book, we have the transcript of the argument in the book. If you go back, you, you just really see these are master class performances. She has an encyclopedic knowledge of the field because she's writing it in real time. Um, and she really understood her audience and how to grab them. And she clearly did in that argument, winning that case, maybe not as much as she wanted to. She, she never fully achieved the highest level of scrutiny um, that she wanted to see applied to gender discrimination in the same way as it was to race. But she won overwhelmingly the cases that she brought to the Supreme Court, including that one. The one that she didn't win, and, and one of very few that she didn't win, to the point that Clara was just making, was a case called Vorchheimer. And Vorchheimer, she talks about this in the book, and a lot of people don't know this. This is a case she was involved in in the 70s that challenged the separation of girls and boys in, in um, what were high achieving high schools in Philadelphia. And the boys school had far better facilities and better opportunities. And she was involved in writing the opening brief, uh, but as she explained to me last summer, there was a disagreement with the original lawyer on the case who eventually sort of pushed the ACLU off the case wrote the reply brief herself, did the argument herself, and the court wound up splitting four to four in that case, which when the court divides equally means the lower court decision is affirmed. In this case, that meant the separate high schools were upheld as non-discriminatory. So fast forward 20 years, as Clara said, you know, she always took the long view and she just kept doing the work. And 20 years later, she writes an opinion for the Supreme Court in VMI striking down a, a gender exclusive military academy that would not admit women and uh, against the backdrop of a state proposal to create what clearly was going to be an inferior separate institute for women. And she, she talks in the book about how Marty joked with her, well, my gosh, you're still litigating the Borchheimer case. <laughs> but of course, the answer is she's not just litigating it, it's finally been won. And it may have taken 20 years, but we got there. And that's, uh, I think, a real testament to her perseverance and how she thought about the work in terms of the long game. Uh, yeah, I would, I would love to remind our audience that uh, we do have a Q&A function uh, on your Zoom screen, uh, so you'll be able to see and you can uh, ask questions and I'll, I'll bring them to the panelists uh, for further discussion. Uh, one, one of the first ones that we received was from uh, Ariana Morell. She says she's a 13-year-old political activist, uh, and she was wondering, how do you think uh, Justice Ginsburg would describe this book? And that's, I guess, for both of you. I, I, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you what she hoped for. When we were putting it together and ultimately, for example, talking about the dedication, the dedication in the book is to our families. Uh, family was absolutely central to her and, and it is to me as well. But, but more to your point, it was uh, dedicated, we, we dedicated the book to those who work to make ours a more perfect union. And so I think that tells you a lot about what she thought about this book. She hoped that her life and she hoped that her legacy would inspire people, would inspire people to care about the things she cared about and would inspire people to keep doing the work. She, I, I'm prone to sports analogies as a former college athlete. She is someone who left it all on the field. She made the most of every day. She gave selflessly, she served, she contributed. And it's now up to all of us to pick up and continue that work. And I think the hope of the book, as we envisioned it, was that it would inspire people to do that. Uh, Clara has much, if she wants to I add. think that was a great answer. <laughs> uh, 
you know, there are four opinions in the book. There's, there's the VIMI case. Um, there's the Ledbetter case, which is about pay discrimination. Um, there's the Shelby County case, uh, which is about the Voting Rights Act. There's the Hobby Lobby case, which is about RIFRA and uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, one of the questions from the audience is, what were the other opinions that, that you recommended or that were considered uh, for inclusion in the book? Well, there were a few. Um... One in particular that I had wanted to include was her final opinion from last term, which as it turns out wound up being her final opinion. Uh, and it was in a case called Little Sisters of the Poor. It was a case that raised similar issues to the Hobby Lobby case where we've included a dissent. In both cases, she was in dissent. In both cases, she was complaining um, and disagreeing with the majority's decision to read broad exceptions into the mandate in the ACA, the healthcare legislation that required employers to provide for contraceptive coverage for employees. And what I love about her last opinion, other than you know, all the things I love about all of her opinions, how beautifully they're written, how powerfully they're written, um, how clear they are, how accessible they are, even to people who are not trained lawyers, but this one in particular, there's a line in there where she chastises the majority for leaving women to fend for themselves. And it was, in my view, just a, another example of how powerful a pen was in her hand and how she could really make her views known respectfully always, but she never backed away from a fight. And uh, so, all things being equal, I, I, I would have added that one. There were a few others, but um, I, we talk, I talk about that opinion in, in the afterward. <laughs> I sneaked it in there. <laughs> uh, Claire, are there any, are there any you know, all, we've, we've discussed a lot of, of work in cases uh, that your grandmother took part in. Is there any, are there any others that sort of stand out to you that we haven't discussed? You know, it not, any sort of in particular, except to say that, you know, a lot obviously of the focus um, on her both advocacy and opinions when she was on the court is rightly so on the opinions that and advocacy that touched on issues of, you know, social justice, whether that's, you know, sex-based discrimination, um, racial discrimination through voting rights discrimination. Uh, and those are all really important. Um, and it's right that they should be celebrated. But she was also a civil procedure nut. And she loved sort of what lay people, but also most lawyers would consider to be pretty boring, weedy cases about when a case can be heard by a court and when a case can't be heard by a court and all of the, you know, possible procedural deficiencies that can arise. And, you know, um, I think that that's something that sometimes gets overlooked because it's not as sexy or as exciting as some of the other cases that she's known for, especially these in the book. But in some ways, it's just as important because she was so invested in and interested in making sure that people got their say, got their day in court. And before, you know, as lawyers learn early in their legal careers, you know, the, the very first class you have to take as a law student, no matter what law school you go to is civil procedure. And that's all about how you get a case heard in front of a court. And so before you even get to the merits of a case, before you can argue why a law is discriminatory or, you know, get the damages that you're seeking from an injury, you have to clear the procedural hurdles. And so those procedural elements are threshold, the most important part of a case. And she dedicated so much thought and so much writing to those kinds of cases because she deeply cared about the ability of individuals to be able to plead their cases and to get to that stage where they could make those arguments about their discrimination claims or about an injury that they suffered. And I think that's something that's something that does get overlooked, but I think really does dovetail with a broader um, narrative about her fight for social equality through the law. I believe she did. Matt, I've got to interject here. I'm absolutely beaming hearing Clara say all of this because I'm a civil procedure teacher <laughs> in no small measure because 
she was too. And, and these issues are so important. And I happen to know I have some of my former students who studied civil procedure with me watching. And so they're, they're no doubt seeing how happy I am to hear you say that because I think it is a part of her jurisprudence that we don't talk enough about. But in the day-to-day -day machinery of the law, the way that she thought about access to justice is so, so important to opening up the, the legal system to people to make their claims. And at the end of the day, the Ledbetter case, which is in the book, is actually a case about procedure. It's a case about when was the appropriate time to bring a pay discrimination claim and ultimately had much broader impact, right? And, and it was about gender discrimination. And But, uh, but the, the minutia, the actual legal uh, analysis is about when the clock resets, if at all, when bringing this kind of claim that Lily Ledbetter wanted to bring to prove that she had been discriminated against because of the sole fact that she was a woman. Um, but at its core, the Ledbetter case was a procedure case. And if I remember correctly, in the Ledbetter case, she said in her dissent that the, the ball was now basically in Congress's court. Uh, and Congress took it up and, and ran with it, more or less, correct? Yes, and it wound up being one of the first laws that President Obama signed. And I will share, and Clara knows this better than me, she had a, a picture of Obama signing the law with Lily Ledbetter standing over his shoulder in her chamber. She was very proud of that. And it, it's, it's a part of how she thought about the law. She, and she thought about her role. This was a statutory scheme. It had to do with Title VII, which governs employment discrimination. And she viewed the courts in conversation with Congress. And she was only too happy to point out that she thought the majority was wrong in that case, but ultimately Congress could fix it. And if you go back and you look at her work as an advocate in the 1970s, I actually recently stumbled across an op-ed that she wrote for the New York Times. Actually, I should say my research assistant found it, an op-ed that she wrote for the New York Times um, complaining about the Supreme Court's inability to recognize that pregnancy discrimination was gender discrimination. And the last line of that op-ed that she co-authored with a fellow ACLU lawyer says, well, you know what, Congress can fix this. And sure enough, Congress did in enacting the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. So this was not a tactic that was new to her by the time we get to lead better. Uh, one of the uh, audience members has a, a sort of a broad question, um, but I, you know, there's been a lot of, of discussion about Justice Ginsburg and a lot of people sharing memories. And I, I thought this was a really interesting one. What's something you wish more people knew about Justice Ginsburg? I guess this is for both of you. Clara, you want to lead us off? No, I'll let you go first. Sorry. <laughs> I think, um, you know, what's interesting is for those of us who clerked for her before she was notorious, we have two groups of law clerks, the pre-notorious and the post-notorious. Uh, for those of us who were pre-notorious, uh, we knew she was a rock star. We knew she was amazing. We knew about all these incredible things that she had done. And one of the great things about her becoming so prominent was that everyone else learned it. But one of the things that you didn't get to see if you didn't know her, was how incredibly kind she was and how thoughtful she was and how much she looked out for people. And I was fortunate enough as were all of her law clerks to see this in spades. There are so many different stories I can tell. I can tell about letters that came in during difficult periods of adversity in my life where she tried to lift me up um, and shared wisdom from her long and, um, long and wise life. Um, I can tell stories about little gestures about how, for example, the first time she cited my work as a scholar, she sent me a signed copy of the slip opinion in which she did so. And of course, I framed it and it hangs in my office. Um, my favorite story is about my interview with her when I uh, interviewed to be her law clerk. To my great good fortune, at the end of it, she offered me the clerkship and I went back, I was in the middle of finals. I was a 3L in law school. I was in the middle of finals, which was good because it meant that I didn't have time to get overly nervous for the interview. I was nervous about my final exam. Uh, but anyway, I had to fly back to school. So I went to the airport and I called my grandparents 
And my grandparents had not gone to college and they were not big followers of current events as the story will highlight. And I said, I'm gonna clerk for Justice Ginsburg at the Supreme Court. And my grandfather, after a long pause said, is that a real lawyer job? <laughs> he was really concerned about this. And then my grandmother said, who's Justice Ginsburg? And I found myself explaining to her all about this great woman and, and how much she had done and how much she had opened up opportunities for people, including a lot of women like me. And my grandmother said, oh my gosh, she sounds amazing. I'm so proud that you will clerk for her. And I went back and I wrote the justice a letter. I said, thank you so much. I can't wait to serve as your law clerk. And I decided to relay to her this story. And she returned back a characteristically generous letter to me, but she also included a letter separately for my grandmother, which I then forwarded on to my grandmother. And uh, she had it professionally framed and she hung it in the most prominent place in her living room until the day she died. And that, that was a little gesture. It took only a few minutes, but what an impact it had. And that, that's the kind of person she was. And I, I wish more people had been able to see that side of her. That was a really good answer. <laughs> um, I, I guess I'll go with a little bit of levity. Um, and, you know, I, I think when it comes to the notorious RBG and stuff and all of the stuff that followed, whether that was her face on t-shirts or whatnot, you know, I think that she really took it in stride. And that's something that I, I hope people know is that she really did appreciate the outpouring of love and support from, you know, people she would never get the opportunity to meet. And she also had a lot of fun with it in the pictures that you actually see in the book and her conversations with Amanda, you can see she's carrying a tote bag with her face on it. Uh, and on the back is the title of a book, a children's book that was written sort of about her story. And she took it all really in stride. And um, I think that just sort of, again, sort of spoke to who she was because she was excited about the fact that she was inspiring a broader audience and inspiring younger generations that she probably never imagined, even when she was nominated to the Supreme Court, that her message would reach that many people. And so, you know, she had direct interactions with people like Amanda's grandmother, you know, writing a note and she kept doing things like that until the very end of her life. You know, she was, um, you know, celebrated for her personalized thank you cards whenever people would send her things. But she also knew that she could spread that inspiration and her message more broadly through the sort of notoriety that she gained in the sort of last decade of her life. And I think it's something that she actually, you know, really enjoyed um, and thought was a lot of fun. So we only have uh, time for one question left. Uh, and fortunately, I, I think the audience has, has a good one. It's from Madison McCauley, uh, who says they're an eighth grader at DC International. Uh, and they ask, how did Justice Ginsburg feel about the current political climate and especially uh, the progression with gender equality in the court system, I guess, within the legal profession as a whole? Claire, you want to lead us off? Sure. I mean, I, I think she was very excited about the continued um, recognition of gender equality uh, through through the courts. And I don't just mean um, sort of sex based discrimination that she addressed uh, what she advocated for in the 70s. But, you know, in the last term that she was on the court, the court recognized um, uh, equality rights for um LGBT individuals, including trans individuals. And that, even though she didn't write an opinion in that case, that was something that she felt very strongly about. And I think was very proud that the court had come that far um, during her tenure on the court, because when she, when she was first confirmed to the court in 1993, I think they were a very far cry from rec not only recognizing same-sex marriage, but recognizing that discrimination based on um, trans uh, trans status was something I don't think they could have even have imagined in the 1990s. And so I think she was very excited and very proud that the court had come that far. But to that end, I think she recognized that 
the, the court's path was an echo of society's path. And she was one uh, to say that courts should not go out of step with society and that when a court would go too far, there might be backlash and that a court had to, I think she said something along the lines of the courts have to reflect the climate of the era and not the weather of the day. And so that the court was able to put out those opinions during her last term, recognizing equal rights for the LGBT community was a reflection of broader societal values, which I think made her very excited and very proud. So even if things were happening sort of in the immediate political realm with, you know, sort of partisanship and and deadlock uh, in politics, that's not, uh, at least she thought, a reflection of uh, the broader uh, uh, sort of the, the broader themes in society. And I think that, you know, um, she was able to look back on her career and also the arc uh, that the court took during her time and, and be very proud. I would only add uh, that I, I think it would have made her so happy to see a woman sworn in as the vice president of the United States. And she would have, again, you know, picking up on what Clara said, she would have pointed at that and said, look at the progress we're making. We, yes, we still have a ways to go, but we've come so far. And when I think about her and I think about the book that we put together and I think about her legacy, I think that that is a central component to it is celebrating what we've achieved, but not letting up, continuing to do the work. And um, so being inspired and being encouraged but putting your nose down and getting to work. <laughs> because when I think about Justice Ginsburg and specifically working with her, that's who she was. She just put her nose down and she, she did the work. And, and uh, she, was, she was relentless in that regard. Uh, well, thank you so much for, we're, we're almost out of time, but oh, I'm sorry. Oh no, please do go on um, to complete the thought, but doing the work feels like a great place to put the pin in our discussion. Um, we really do want to thank all of you, um, Amanda L. Tyler, Clara Spera, Matt Ford, and our audience out there for this engaging and thoughtful discussion. Your patronage and dedication really enable us to bring you this type of programming, and we simply couldn't do it without the book sales to support it. So please do go follow the link in the chat to purchase your copy of Justice, Justice Thou Shalt Pursue, or you can visit politics-prose.com. And while you're there, um, feel free to check out our events calendar for the latest and greatest from our shelves. And from us to you, we hope you're out there staying safe, staying strong, and of course, staying well-read. And maybe as Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg would want us to do, staying relentless. Um, from us to you, we will see you next time. Thank you all again and have a great evening.